Greetings viewers and you find me at the wheel of a bit of an anomaly in the Indian auto industry. It's called the Mercedes-Benz E-Class All-Terrain and it's a station wagon. Now we've had estates in India in the past but the thing is they had their time in the sun and then they died out. It's a shame. Now however Luxury car makers seem to be bringing them back and this E-Class All-Terrain is a good example of how they're doing that. To sweeten the deal and make them a little bit more appealing, they're adding things like a rugged touch. This All-Terrain version, for instance, it has rugged bits on the outside, a rugged grille, rugged cladding, it's got larger wheels, it's got air suspension so you can raise the ride height and it's got 4MATIC all-wheel drive. So, a bit more than your average E-Class sedan then. And personally, I'm very glad about this because I love estate cars and I love these rugged estate cars as well. They're just so appealing to me because they do enough of the rough stuff, but they're still superb luxury cars at the end of the day. They pamper you, they're well equipped. And you wouldn't mind turning up to a five-star hotel in any one of them. I think it's the fact that they're the sort of underdog's choice, the rarity, the left field approach that I like them so much. So it's clear that it's got the look right and there is a certain appeal to it. What I'm here to find out today is if it can deliver on that appeal. So just what makes this E-Class all-terrain tick then? Well for starters it's an E220D and if that sounds familiar it is the same engine you get in the E-Class sedan. However, in the sedan, that engine is BS4 compliant, while here, this is the first of its kind in India to be a BS6 compliant 4-cylinder diesel engine. It's the same motor we recently saw in the facelifted C-Class and it will be introduced in the sedan version of the E-Class by the end of the year. Now, despite all the modifications to make it BS6 compliant, it still puts out the same 194 horsepower and 400 newton meters as the E-Class sedan. And it's also still mated to this wonderful 9-speed automatic. We really like it. For instance, if this motor does have any turbo lag, it's really hard to tell because the gearbox is so on top of it. It just shifts its way around the turbo lag and keeps you in the meat of the power band. And what you get is a nice, strong, uninterrupted pull. It makes getting this car moving very, very easy. Now, unlike the E220D sedan, this one has air suspension and all-wheel drive. So how has that affected the dynamics? The steering still feels really quick and nice. Now remember, this is the shorter wheelbase E-Class, so it does feel slightly tidier than the long wheelbase car, but it's still a pretty big car. Now because it's air suspension, it gives you a wonderfully comfy ride in comfort mode and the slightly floaty feeling at high speeds and that's okay. However, it does feel a little bit jittery at low speeds and over bumps. It does pitter patter and that also might have a little something to do with the 19 inch alloy wheels that this car rides on. The advantage of air suspension of course is that you can raise the ride height and that truly gives it a bit of soft roading capability if not all out off roading capability. It means you can traverse a dirt track with a little bit more peace of mind. However, even at its highest suspension setting, this car never feels any different from a sedan to drive. It doesn't feel like you're sitting any higher or in a crossover-like position. It just feels quite like a regular E-Class. And the other thing is, the raised ride height only lasts until speeds of 35 km per hour. So the moment you cross that, it lowers down again and becomes a regular E-Class at least in terms of ride height. There are a lot of things I like about this interior. For one, the quality. It's just superb with very few bits that you could really fault. And just generally, the design of the E-Class cabin was always quite special and it continues to be so even here. As with the India Spec sedan, it still doesn't get the digital dials that you get in Europe. Now I know what you're thinking. You've heard me say this before, right? The same sort of motivational speech about the rugged luxury estate and you're right I have done this before and that's because Mercedes isn't the first company to tackle this formula here in India oh no that'd be Volvo
Now, when I said earlier that I really, really like this sort of car, well, it's this very car, the V90 Cross Country, that wormed its way into my heart. And also like the Mercedes E-Class all-terrain, this one gets a two-liter diesel engine, but this one makes quite a bit more power and torque at 235 horsepower and 480 newton meters. And you can feel that power advantage pretty early on. There's just a much greater reserve of it at your disposal the moment you touch the accelerator pedal. However, the difference is where the Mercedes makes it low down in a strong, solid hit, this one eases you into it. What doesn't work in the V90 Cross Country's favor is the gearbox. It's an 8-speed automatic and, well, it's a little bit slow to react to your input. So that's the engine, but there is another very crucial mechanical difference between this and the E-Class. Yes, this too has all-wheel drive like the E-Class does and that does give you a nice reassured feeling when you're going around corners, especially on a wet day like this. But where the E-Class has air suspension at all four corners, this one only has air suspension at the rear. And that has its implications. For one, it means that you can't raise the ride height of this car, but that's okay because they've set it to a nice solid SUV rivaling 210 millimeters. That's a lot for an estate car. And the steering, well, it's not quite as quick or sharp as the one in the Mercedes, so it doesn't encourage you to chuck this car around as easily, as frequently as that car. The thing about this suspension setup, though, is even though it doesn't have air suspension at the front and it's riding on 20-inch wheels compared to the Mercedes 19-inch wheels, this feels like the better ride of the two. Now, yes, the E-Class's interior was really special and I did quite like it a lot but come on you have to admit this one is really special too I like the minimalism of everything and how everything is confined to the touchscreen with only the volume controls and some of the audio controls left to physical buttons however that does bring up another problem is that I wish there were a few more buttons sometimes because when you're on the move trying to look at the touchscreen and operate it can be a bit of a pain but where the Volvo once again takes home the championship belt is with the equipment list. This car is really fully loaded. So now that you know what they're like up front, time now to park these two cars up and tell you what things are like in the back seat. It's important to remember that the E-Class All-Terrain is a standard wheelbase E-Class, unlike the sedan. But you still agree that knee room is still quite okay. The backrest doesn't recline either and it is a little bit upright. But what you really like is that the seat is really plush and comfortable and thigh support is decent as well. All in all, I think people who are used to luxury cars will be quite okay in the back seat of the E-Class All-Terrain. Now the Volvo 2 has a very spacious back seat. In fact, I think it might actually have a bit more knee room than the E-Class, but apart from that, it's not all that great. For instance, the backrest again is a bit upright like the Mercs. It also has a high center tunnel like the Mercs, but the cushions on the seats are a tad firm and that could get annoying over a long distance. Overall, I think the Mercedes is the one with a better back seat of the two. These are station wagons too, so we have to talk a bit about the luggage area. On sheer numbers, the Merc trounces the Volvo with 670 litres of cargo volume versus 560. It even has the lower loading lip, so putting in your gear will be easier. However, the big difference is that the Merc's spare tyre will sit on the boot floor, while the Volvo's is stuck nicely into a recess underneath. So in practice, the Volvo's boot is actually more usable. It's no secret that I'm a fan of the V90 Cross Country, but what really proved a surprise was the E-Class All-Terrain. The luxury of the E-Class translates well into a rugged estate, and it's got the better backseat of the two. The thing is, since these are lifestyle vehicles, there's a greater chance that they will actually be driven by their owners. And from behind the wheel, you might as well be behind the wheel of an E220D sedan. The All-Terrain just doesn't differentiate itself enough. Even the liftable ride height only lasts a short while. The V90 Cross Country, on the other hand, feels like an altogether different car from the S90 sedan it's based on. The ride height is raised considerably, it gets a more powerful engine and it feels significantly more like a crossover. There are other ways it nips ahead of the Merc too, like having better ride quality and a far longer equipment list. One area of concern might be Volvo's smaller dealer and service network, but that too has grown a lot in recent times. 
But the real clincher for the V90 Cross Country is the price. At 65.31 lakh rupees X showroom, it's a full 10 lakh cheaper than the E-Class All-Terrain. I'm in the center of exactly nowhere right now. And as a motorcycle enthusiast, I couldn't have asked for more. To have a limitless landscape, absolute freedom and the ability to go just about anywhere is a motorcyclist's dream and making that dream possible is a breed of motorcycles called the Adventure Tourer. This right here is Suzuki's take on this very fast growing segment and it's called the V-Strom 650 XT. Let's find out if it has the ability to take you exactly where you want to go as well. Before we get to its capabilities, it sure can be said that the V-Strom looks very purposeful. From the characteristic beak and the tall windscreen, to the mostly blacked out cycle parts and a generously proportioned seat, the V-Strom is all about looking like it belongs to the outdoors, and Suzuki has done a good job with fit and finish levels as well. The chunky grab rail, which also extends into a luggage rack, adds ruggedness to the V-Strom's design, apart from a good dose of practicality, of course. The instrument console, however, looks a bit dated, even if sticking to an analog tachometer may have been a conscious decision given that the V-Strom isn't intended to be a city slicker. The switch gear feels built to last and the mode selector button, which allows you to browse through the various readouts and the traction control settings, is very intuitive. What a lot of you will appreciate is that the V-Strom, despite being a 216 kilo motorcycle, is a very friendly package. With a reasonable 835mm seat height and the fuel tank being fairly slim where it meets the rider, the V-Strom doesn't intimidate and it certainly doesn't pose any challenges even when you're just getting familiar with it. The V-Strom ticks all the right boxes in the design department and while it lacks outside aggression, it's got a purposeful stance and presence which makes it gel easily with even bigger adventure tourers out there. I'm a big fan of the wide and spacious seat and the best bit is the bike feels substantial without being inconveniently large in any way. However, is this a case of all style and no substance? Um, let's find out somewhere over there. The V-Strom 645cc motor has a big responsibility on its shoulders. It's meant to take you across continents after all, and thankfully it lives up to it. With 70.7 HP on offer, the V-Strom darts off the line with unsurprising energy, but it's the mid-range performance propelled by the 62nm of torque at hand that has an addictive quality to it. The motor is extremely tractable and its terrific responsiveness means you can overtake without even a moment's hesitation. It's at home sustaining high speeds on the highway with 100 km per hour in 6th gear arriving at the 4500 rpm mark and 120 kph coming in only another 1000 revs later. Thanks to the 20 litre fuel tank, you can also enjoy the V-Strom's highway performance without frequent interruption since it gives you a range of well over 400 kilometers. And if you're the kind who just wants to have a whale of a time kicking up dirt, the V-Strom is only too willing to join in. It's got the off-road hardware you need and with the disengageable traction control system, you can really let its hair down or its tail end loose to be specific and have a ball while you explore undiscovered bits of Africa or whichever inhospitable place takes your fancy. The V-Strom has always been popular internationally given how usable and practical it is and there's a good amount of power to keep you entertained whether you choose to ride on tarmac or off the road. But what makes it really sweet is the generous amount of torque that's available through the rev range. Suzuki's low RPM assist also helps immensely in city crawling because it reduces your chances of stalling unexpectedly. Also, the crisp fueling means you can ride it exactly the way you want without any unpleasant hiccups. It's nice of Suzuki to offer a two-level traction control, although to be very honest, you're not really going to need it given how controllable this motor is. On another note, at 6000 RPM and beyond, there is a mild buzz in the handlebar, but it's not a deal breaker given how comfortable this bike is on the whole. Actually, you know what, I'm just going to go ride it some more. The V-Strom has the ability to keep you riding without sapping you of energy, which is something any good adventure tourer must achieve. Rather than trying to dominate the rider and the terrain, the V-Strom lets you be the hero, backing you up with a solid, dependable package that just won't let you down, no matter how demanding your riding pattern may be. The suspension setup is well suited to the worst Indian roads can offer, and that leaves you with no concerns about bad stretches of roads or even nasty potholes. I wish Suzuki would choose to give it more than the 170mm of ground clearance it currently offers, but that would make it a bit too tall for some riders. However, on the whole, the V-Strom has all the goods to keep you clocking long days in the saddle, which is exactly what you want from this sort of motorcycle. The braking package is on point as well, 
and thanks to the dual channel ABS which cannot be disengaged, you'll find yourself spending more time playing in the dirt than eating it. It's hard to believe how manageable the V-Storm 650 really is. The aluminium twin spar frame keeps the bike slim and makes for very good handling on all kinds of road surfaces. However, unlike the Kawasaki Vs 650, the V-Storm only gets a conventional telescopic fork which means it lacks the outright sport bike agility of the Versus, but it makes up for it by being an overall good handler that keeps you grinning within your helmet. The combination of a 19-inch front and 17-inch rear wheel works beautifully, especially over the rough stuff, and you get these cool wire spoke wheels and tubeless tyres, which is just the right recipe for a healthy dose of adventure. At first impression, the V-Strom comes across as calm, predictable and easy to tame, all of which it is. But as you get to know each other better, it lets you in on what really makes it a fantastic motorcycle. The V-Strom is an immensely capable bike, but it makes no compromises on comfort or rideability, which is commendable. At the end of the day, the formula to the V-Strom's appeal is simple, good engineering, and that can just never go out of style. Having said that, the V-Strom's 4000 km service interval isn't exactly very practical for those of you who are going to clock some serious miles on it. You have to work really hard to earn your freedom, but thanks to the Suzuki V-Strom 650 XT, you only have to work till you have about 7,46,000 rupees at hand, which is the ex showroom price of this motorcycle. Here's a bike you'll really enjoy riding up the mountains, but you'll also have a lot of fun riding it to work on a boring Monday morning. And that kind of combination is just impossible to resist, right? <laughs>
it's not only the value seeker, it's also they want to have the upgrade, the premiumness. So you will see in the interior, touch and feel, a premiumness, what is not there in the segment. It is likely that the India spec kicks will have the same engine and gearbox options as the Nissan Terrano, Renault Duster and Capture, the tried and tested 110 horsepower 1.5 litre diesel engine and 106 horsepower 1.5 litre petrol engine. Gearbox options could also include a 6-speed manual for the diesel and a 5-speed manual for the petrol. A CVT gearbox will eventually be offered with the petrol powered kicks and a diesel automatic combination is also likely to follow but not anytime soon. When it is launched at the start of next year, the Nissan Kicks will go up against the Hyundai Creta, which is a formidable rival. But with this muscular styling, a number of features which Nissan claims will be segment firsts and competitive pricing, the Kicks will be one SUV to look out for.